the impact of what happens in terms of you know not families are not just affected it's also that loss of property and um, either that can be a major loss of property or partial impact of properties in terms of businesses so the business actual delivery is affected property is you know in terms of the actual can't produce or manufacture or carrying that construction so that has a financial impact not just the actual overall delivery of a project or process has major knock-on effects to morale and others if, if the property or partial destruction is destroyed and let's not forget the damage to the environment fire has a massive impact on the environment as well if we if we are going to you know look to extinguish a fire or put printer measures in place the actual effect of that can actually harm the environment as well so for example um, foam is extremely damaged to the environment if you use foam or if you use certain chemicals it can have so we've got to it's not just the impact of loss of life it's also the impact of other areas as well so fire behavior what is it it's a living breathing thing you know it doesn't just take up the triangle of fire in terms of what is what is required so, you know, bit of fire 101 here, we need these three elements plus another to actually enable a fire to occur. So if we've got the right mixture of, you know, heat, fuel and oxygen, that results in that, you know, that, that, that starts to combustible materials and creates, you know, starts to create paralysis. And paralysis is when a something's been affected by fire, it's heated up and every, every um, material in the world has what we call an auto ignition temperature. So once the, heat and the actual fire and the passive elements have made that fire what it is it will actually then start to give itself off and start to paralyze and start to spread fire throughout that compartment and so it's a knock-on but yeah it's 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 a living breathing thing and we need to ensure that you know to do the best we can to make sure that we don't create the perfect mixture or the ideal mixture for a fire to occur So a little bit about fire behavior, a little, you know, this is just a very kind of niche in terms of the life cycle of a fire, everything. So once we have that perfect mixture in terms of we've got those three elements, we've got that passive, we've got that passive mixture, the, the actual then source and time. So we've got this, as I said, look, the kind of the growth curve in terms of, so fire starts, it engulfs what it has around it in terms of it. so paralysis it shakes up the materials around that area and starts to then give off more flammable gases spread within that room and the, the more it kind of increases as it starts to take over the entire compartment and then we look to kind of get what we call flashover which I'll explain in a minute and then we get this fully developed environment within that compartment and then we start to go into the, the the K stage as well. So when a fire can't paralyze, it can't eat any more material. It will then start to die because it hasn't got that perfect mixture of the you know the the triangle fire as 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 it was said. But we just need to be aware of that in terms of if we can remove an element of you know of material at source, then it prevents the, the fire spread and flame spread. So why do people die in fires? smoke is as i've said before smoke is the biggest killer so why is it the biggest killer because smoke isn't just smoke in a fire it's made up of carbon particulates carbon dioxide water vapor and heat energy and the reason people die in fire mostly is because the carbon molecule has a stronger bond than oxygen within the blood so the carbon molecule replaces oxygen within the blood and then your body is starved of oxygen and you then that is the biggest way that people die in a fire yes they die through a means but th that is the single biggest killer so you breathe in two three gulps of that and yeah you're probably not going to survive it unfortunately so when we see that that is the biggest reason we need to ensure that we um make sure that we can remove that as quickly as possible so as i said before what is a what is a flashover so a flashover is when that compartment has basically absorbed and exposed every bit of that combustible material within that area it's reached everything is reached auto ignition temperature and where basically all those thermal gases have ignited within the upper upper, upper heart layer and basically a fully enveloped fire within the actual compartment and as i said before the temperatures can reach very high degrees you know you know you're not going to survive 500 to 590 degrees centigrade trust me but it's just in terms of understanding that's one of the biggest risks to both 
um, you know, fire wardens, but also um, firefighters as well. But it's just to understand that we want to make sure that we mitigate this occurring within the, within within homes and also commercial premises. So backdraft, um, it's not <laughs> it's not the film, unfortunately. It's not called a film. A backdraft again is something which is exceedingly dangerous, um, and it can you know if you are a fire warden and you see you know a room full with kind of black smoke and conditions the reason it's not open the store because you are creating the perfect conditions for a backdraft to occur so a backdraft in simple terms is an underventilated fire it's got the idea it's got the great mixture of heat and the fuel but just hasn't got that oxygen to make it go to that mass that that ideal mixture however when we open that door and we open it too quickly, that rust of oxygen in trains pulls into it and the force velocity is what creates a backdraft and the force is what will unfortunately kill people. Um, it's killed many firefighters and many and many other people. So it's just in terms of understanding that that is a real danger to everyone. And finally, and another is a fire gas explosion. So these are extremely dangerous. Um, you can create them. So when you are in a kitchen or in a, in a and when you leave the gas on, um, and I'll go to explain what it is. Basically, you have a fire below. That fire is creeped up into a compartment that's basically got the everything mixture, and all it's after is that that last bit of heat, which is like last element, which is the fire. Once that reaches our ideal mixture and that's such force velocity, it ramps up to its flammable range very very quickly, and that blast force is what blows buildings apart because it's basically you are in training it's got a huge amount of um, flammable mixture and all you're doing is introducing that fire to basically blow at significant pressure and I'm when I mean significant pressure I mean the um, videos if you want to look on YouTube this the blast pressure force will lift a, con a contain ship container a couple of um, centimeters off the ground that's how volatile a fire gas explosion can be <clears throat> so wouldn't be here if we didn't say how we can actually you know reduce it or extinguish it um, again this is no mere means for a you know if a, if you've got fire warnings use of um, fire apparatus in terms of fire extinguisher i would say anything bigger than a bin fire look to close the door leave it and get out of dodge however if you are trained to do so there's ways so if we, if we can cool it in terms of you know use of extinguishers if we can remove oxygen out of the air so um co2 um, devices within um, areas such as ICT equipment, server rooms, that's used and basically they will remove the oxygen out of the atmosphere. So we're just, we're taking that oxygen out of the way. So we're removing one element of that fire triangle. Um, taking away that fuel, if it's, if we can, if we can remove the fuel in terms of what the actual fire loading, or we can stop it at source, we can create that break point, then it's, then the fire is going to naturally just decay anyway, because it hasn't got the fuel to enrich it and actually carry it on. And flame inhibitors, so sort of things like CO2 as well, that will then blank it at the same time. Um, just two kind of case studies, really, that I'll, I'll, I'll look to kind of put upon. So this, this case study was one that occurred at Hampshire Fire and Rescue on the 1st of June, um, some time ago, and it was around um, a direct a fire risk assessment not being of the suitable, sufficient um, suitability. I'll let you read this in your own time. I'll share the slides. But in terms of this, the fire and rescue service protect team had been in multiple times, um, and basically they'd put enforcement notices in place, and still yet they didn't provide um, what was required in terms of that fire rescue assessment being as, as it should have been as suitable and sufficient. And certain elements were missing, um, and ultimately they were they were fined. Um, a lot and so not just reputational damage affected them also the actual um not occurring to the to, to the law as at the same time um, the other one is a Hereford care home so unfortunately um 2017 two people died in a care home and here they failed to comply with fire safety legislation after again multiple visits from the fire rescue services protect team and here excuse me they lacked the competent staff they didn't actually put on terms of evacuations within the care home and also 
it, it, the, what they found out is it needs to be properly managed in terms of evac training and also testing of their of their systems so that's there's myriad more in terms of case studies but these are kind of two prevalent ones in terms of one being ensured providing a suitable and sufficient fire risk assessment and make sure you have that competent person to undertake it and secondly around training of actual the competent staff within your organization so simple for managing fire risk there's some there's more but kind of the key areas which i which i believe are great to managing fire risk is designing out from the out designing out the risk in the outset that fire assessment is a key key tool but it doesn't come without training instruction information and it kind of makes up in terms of that holistic approach yes you've got the the, the the legality and the legal aspects but there are other areas that need to be in place as well so from the outset can we if we can do it from the outset that is exceedingly well so during that construction phase that design process um the client and if they've brought the principal designer and the principal contractors and the principal designer within cdm sorry construction design management regulations 2015 they have that requirement to ensure that fire safety is managed and at the risk associated are designed out so far as reasonably practicable so can we um what passive measures and fire strategies will we develop for that certain building to look at how then we we look to develop that to ensure that we either put in correct standards to, towards our building or we make sure that the risk is identified and passed on and managed because we can't eliminate every risk we have to then practically manage those and so forth so some some things like design standards fire safety bs999 and approved document b are some of them and others documents to help as well so you've got hsg 168 fire safety and construction which has just been redone revamped that will give you some really good kind of guidance in terms of how we look to manage fire safety within the construction phase um, but also gives ideas of the when we hand over as well of course the regulatory reform fire safety order that kind of that, that regulatory document and um, the jcop so the joint code of practice um, for protection from fire of construction sites and buildings undergoing renovation um, is a great in terms of um, insurers use this a lot of time or if a building is higher value so for example i've worked on construction projects which have been higher value and this has been required to be used and it goes above and beyond hst 168 to actually look at not just the design phase also the construction as i said the building regulation um for document b which is the actual the building regulatory requirement for fire safety and bs And um, so, simple. The fire assessment is the main way to manage fire risk within your organisation, and you know the, the five-step process um, completes to convert it. But again, it's around looking at making sure that whoever does it has that level of competency to deliver on that fire risk management. So you know, check for the hazards, look at the people you've got, take action, plan, and regularly review it. Um, in terms of that review. That is, under, that is up to you in terms of how regularly you look to review it, um, it can, depending on the risk factors. So I said training and testing is also exceedingly important. Yes, that fire assessment is important, but we can't shy away from looking at how we keep you know, visitors, contractors, employees safe. So that's around looking at how we do suitable induction training. So every person that comes to your site, whether that be a contractor, whether that be a visitor or new employee they should all have an induction but a level of fire safety induction will be um, dis decided on what they're doing if it's a contractor that fire safety induction will be a lot higher than say a visitor but you need to make sure that is um reasonable within the business that you are working with them um regular fire safety training so that's around you know mandatory training is also around you know one one day to look at how we then train people so you know there's various means of fire safety training and um, evacuation training you know testing you know it's important to carry out evacuation drills on a regular basis um to make sure that your people are prepared if that happens and also on fire drills and you know i, I within businesses i always suggest that we they do a fire evacuation drill and an announce one every year but that's just on the risk level that i've been in could be different um, test your procedures, always stress test what you've got in place and also some live scenarios, some kind of 
are always good to look at how we can prevent fire occurring, what fire was to occur, what can we do to actually prevent it occurring, or the measures make sure that the standards that we have in place are suitable. And of course, liaison with the fire rescue service. Um, fire rescue service have a statutory duty um, to understand and undertake um, seven part two, seven part two Ds um, organizations. So they'll come in and look at the risks and advice, but it's also good to liaise and not just within. Yes, if you're designing construction or something, they are a key statutory stakeholder and key engagement, you must liaise with them. However, it's also good when that building is built to then continue to engage with them. So I said before, instruction is, is key. You know, it's looking at how we display notices around the actual, actual building from instructions for staff, from instructions for visitors, and they must be clear, they must be uh, visible on every notice board and up to date, and also make sure they're up to date with if we have escape routes that need to change, any significant change, make sure your staff are aware of that change. Uh, and also the correct procedure for both discovering a fire and how we raise the alarm and firefighting if we need to, and also the evacuation and also that count, accounting for people within, within the building. So that's for where registers and staff entrance and exit um, are vital and very key. Uh, information again, it's it's vital for any organisation. So that's around looking at where fire assembly points are located, any fire safety signage, um, information on fire wardens. You know, so they're normally displayed with pictograms of who they are and their contact details. And again, the level of number of fire wardens will be attributed to the business that you're working in. Um, and then the um, hazard pictograms. So on if we if we, if we, if we are using. Um, have a lot more gases, processes, procedures, um, or fuels, then make sure there's the actual um, um, correct pictograms that are actually on those um, items to make sure that people are aware of the fire risk. So just some kind of control measures which I believe should be in place. I'm gonna focus on kind of construction fire risks and also some more general ones, but because I work predominantly in construction, I'm gonna focus on um, those kind of risks in terms of in terms of fire. So arson, it's a massive risk to any site, any building, any commercial property. You could have a disgruntled employee. You can have someone looking for sabotage. We do live in a world now where security is becoming more of a risk. Um, if, if you work on any high value information or assets, um, and also someone, you know, just someone looking to essentially you know, rob you as well. So how do we control that? make sure your site is absolutely secure if it's if it's a construction area um, suitable and sufficient hoarding to make sure that area is in place um, cctv um, alarms sets and also make sure that we have identified where there's high risk of that vandalism could occur and also make sure that if there are any openings which are vulnerable make sure a you make sure they're closed out and also b you don't put fire risk material within those areas as well because someone could just Lob a lighter over and it could commence the fire. Uh, waste again, big risk in terms of um, when we're developing, you know, especially in construction, we're gonna we're gonna make mess to make better. So as part of this, you know, we will um, skips are gonna be needed, they can be closed, they can be open. But again, this is around a suitable and sufficient system to manage that waste and to not, and more importantly, not let it build up because that's, you know, if we allow it to build up, we're, we're actually creating a fire load. So let's get rid of it as soon as we can. And also um, look at where separating waste where required to basically ensure that the separate waste has separate skips that are away from each other and um, to basically to prevent that fire jump or fire load. If we are looking to use uh, any shoots on scaffolding, make sure they conform to the correct British standard and also um, regular empty of the skips um, that are used. So that should be within your uh, own kind of waste management system or waste management plan for the construction site. So ensure that that's considered in terms of, you know, getting empty on a regular basis before they create significant fire load. Electrical safety. So, you know, because I was saying, you know, electrical hazards, you know, yeah, they carry their own risk, but they also then carry fire risk as well. So with this, it's around ensuring that every single electrical apparatus you have on site is 
inspected and tested to the required standards. If you have any temporary electricals like 110 volt leads on site, any temporary lighting, make sure it's, it's bought, it's hired by a reputable company, it's tested and it carries its inspection logs with it. If we are having temporary cabins that we're using, probably will have on a construction site, if they're being used, then make sure that the RCDs are tested within their required um, standards um, to make sure and ensure that fire risk doesn't occur. Dust control. So why do I talk about dust? Well, you think it's just a thing that can affect the health of people. Well, no, it can't. It can also, it's also an explosive and it's packed to a huge, a certain amount. It can actually create an explosive risk in terms of that reach auto ignition. It can actually um, create an explosion force. There was a case study um, in Derby. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I will find it where a dust explosion killed many people and the, the, root, the root cause of this was the, filt the filtration system was not being cleaned out enough. So on this, it's around ensuring that we regularly have dust control measures on site. So any, any cutting equipment has a dedicated um, extraction source and also we are clearing up dust as we go in terms of correct HVAC systems um, to allow to, to mitigate the dust creation on the site. Gas cylinders, we're always going to use gas cylinders of some kind, you know, hot works, welding, um, be it, you know, be for, for use, so they could be LPG, they could be oxygen acetylene um, requirements. And when we are managing those is let's reduce the amount we can store on site. So within the design phase, if we can look to mitigate the use of um, cutting equipment by different means, um, modular build, design for manufacturing assembly, that's that's great, but if we have to use them, ensure that we have minimised quantity stored on site. Before we use any of them, check for them, they've got the correct lead stators on, correct they're all fitted and actually connected properly before anyone uses them. Any smell of gas at any time, you isolate straight away um, because that is that you are then inventing actual, um, ga actual gas which then can cause um, explosion or fire. Uh, always in the right or right position and never kink hoses as well. It's kind of a given. Um, with acetylene as well, acetylene involved in fire is, is a massive risk. So um, acetylene has the biggest flammable range of any um, any gas. So it's, uh, you, know, two, you know, two to 92 percent. It's a massive range. So therefore, we, if we are going to use oxygen acetylene on site, it needs to be the minimum amount and also considered to be used in the correct way. And also, if we are going to use more than different gases, we'll also have to consider um, the disease regulations as well. So we may be required to compile a, um, a disease risk assessment at the same time to mitigate the cross uh, uh, flammability of the gases. And when they're removed and when they're stored on site, make sure to ensure they are stored in um, locked cages, at least um, uh, suitable distance away from each other. Hot works, as I said, it's, um, we probably have to do some hot works on site at some time. So it's defined as a process which generates flame sparks or heat, and that's the biggest risk. If we're gonna make that, that heat or flame jump and then start a fire somewhere else. So how we manage this is through a suitable permit to work system. So, you know, in terms of, I understand what hot work is gonna be taking place, the, how long it's been taken for, what precaution are we putting in place? So if we are going to have to do what works, is it in a suitable location? Has it got screens around it? Has it got any kind of combustible materials that we need to remove before that hot work is undertaken? And electrical installations, any kind of gas, you know, making sure, our, as I said before on the last slide, ensure that if we need any gas bottles, they're in the right procedure. How we raise the alarm, is that through, you know, is that through audible or is that got a wireless alarm system on at the time? And also who is in, a, a is in direct control of the work, so is that operative competent to undertake the works? And also that person authorising the works, so normally like a site manager or a site supervisor, and they should be the only people who are really looking to authorise um, whole works. And you, if you have a large site, you need to ensure that they are managed and also the time to close them out as well. So normally when a whole works permit is done, it should be an hour before that site or premises closer to the day. So if you finish at five o'clock, any hot works 
a normal site should stop at four to allow that hour of fire watch to prevent any residual flames occurring, hopping, jumping and resulting in a fire. If we're looking at timber buildings, it's two hours because of the, tim because of the potential of the small amount of sacrificial timber which is in the actual timber frame. So anything so said before, if you're a timber frame building, you, you permit, if you finish at five on the site, you must, that permit must be closed by um, two. And also, it's very important that these permits are closed out and signed to be closed out as well. Fuel management, massive risk on sites. We have to use fuel, we have to use diesel, petrol, and all those bring with it massive flammable risks. Um, they're normally double bonded, but it's just in terms of how can we mitigate the amount we have on, on site. So what's the most suitable we can use? Just in time deliveries as well. So keeping that um, quantity of fuel to the lowest limit that we can do, we still understand, still undertaking that process. And also where we can select different alternatives will be a lot safer as well. So we can do, you know, actually look to remove that risk. And also, if we are looking towards like a near where a kind of a large structure is, ensure that we is a, a is adequately distanced from that site, and also the actual volume won't, won't be affected. And also uh, have plans in place to mitigate the spread of fuel because it's not just damaging from the environment; it's also very highly flammable when released. So modern batteries. So we are the world is moving on. So I don't know if you've seen, but there's lithium ion batteries cause a heck of a lot of risk when they're engulfed in flame. These lithium ion batteries on scooters, on things like that, these, these can burn for hours, and I mean hours. So we will put them in baths. So if we are going to use modern batteries, we need to understand the risk so with the use of them and how, we, you know, how they're stored and how they're removed from site. Because as the world moves towards more use of um, modern day technology, we need to be ready for it on our sites. Um, so for, you know, fire wardens are probably one of the, the key aspects in terms of controlling on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, again, they can be, you know, they need to be trained, so they need to go on a course to be trained, you know, you can deliver that in-house or externally, that's your decision and choice, but their, their duties are you know, weekly checks on all the fire alarms, make sure if it's a installable system, it's a wireless system, and how that's connected to that fire panel. Most exits are clear and remain clear. You know, housekeeping is a massive risk as well in terms of how we manage on a site. You know, make sure that every exit for emergency purposes is clear. Uh, are every fire is every fire extinguisher checked, ready to be used, and is it the right extinguisher as well? Fire doors, you know, they're, they're a key aspect to preventing that spread of fire. I said before, if we look at the spread of fire in terms of a compartment, so we split a building up into compartments, the fire door is a key um, distinguishing break point between a fire spreading and a fire potentially dying out in the core because it can't get any more um, fuel. Um, should, be, should be at least um, to the level of that compartment as well. Emergency lighting. Um, that needs to be checked and inspected on a regular basis by a competent person and make sure it's in good working order. As I said before, when we're stress testing, this is one of the things we can do. We can make sure that the emergency lighting is working adequate. So if, if touch wood, it doesn't, but if it would happen, we know that in that control measure works. And fire safety signage. Firstly, is it adequate? And is it in the right place? And is it fixed to the wall? Yeah, I've been to sites where it's the wrong way up and sideways and it's, it just it doesn't give any confidence in terms of any event of a fire that that could actually you know put them in the wrong way or they wouldn't leave the building and that's a real hazard so for housekeeping let's let's cut it to an absolute minimum let's make sure a tidy site the first thing when people walk onto a site or walk onto anything and look at a good health and safety culture is looking at the kind of the level of housekeeping in terms of that site it kind of gives general awareness of the the the, the level of um, culture Equipment, I said before, devices pack tested, need to be pack tested on a regular basis or inspected on a regular basis as well. And every staff member must be inducted. And it's also good to re induct people as well because if people have been there for two, three years, um, it's always good to have that mini re induction. 
annual fire drill is really important and maintaining records of any fire drills undertaken, any faults in any systems. And it's good as is a really important piece of compliance, because if you get, you know, an enforcement authority, they'll look at that and go in, right, okay, management records, how are you maintaining those? Plant equipment. Plant equipment is massive on any construction site. It's you it has to be used, it's mostly used in various ways, but it doesn't, it does bring it does bring it risks as well. Um, so what do we need to understand if they're used in a well-ventilated area and well positioned? and also where the hazards and what precaution measures are to be taken place. The biggest risk in terms of fire creation here is probably when we're refueling. Um, so, you know, don't operate it when, you know, don't operate anything when we're refueling. And also consider what equipment we can use in terms to reduce the risk. So can we use electric, electric powered vehicles as we are coming further into that new kind of new technology? And everything must be inspected and tested before it comes to site if you're hiring it, which probably will be. So if you look at the passive fire measures in terms of these are the, you know, I said before, these are around compartmentation, fire measures, ductwork, fire doors, and you know, life safety systems, which are within the building, they, they, they act as they accordingly do. So, you know, a suitable and sufficient fire doors, which has the suitable standing of what the risk is within, within, within a building, um, have a fire alarm system, um, which links, you know, you're always good to have a fire plan and that, that fire alarm system which links to accordance with the rest of your alarms ensure that suitable smoke detectors are in place throughout your building and, also, and if you are doing any kind of cooking or within the kitchen a heat detector as well because a heat detector is different to a smoke detector so ensure that's in place as well and also compartmentation is a critical um, aspect of the passive fire measures that has been designed as a, normally an hour within that box but if you penetrate that box, you are then going to compromise the fire, the fire resistance or the fire rating of that box, so to speak. So if you are going to make any penetrations, if you're going to do refurbishment works, if you've made any penetrations, you must fire stop within those um, areas to prevent that fire spread and maintain the level of compromisation that has been designed to undertake. Uh, so for active, the active is, you know, we have to use them. So it's, you know, um, sprinklers will go off, fire detection systems, smoke detection and fire extinguishers are just a couple to name a few. Um, sprinklers are great. They're great methods. They're a great source in terms to bring down a fire because you, they, they will activate on when they reach a certain temperature. And it's a real good mitigation measure. We are imploring, especially in the design phase, to... Um, ensure that with designers have considered and fire safety engineers, sorry, the fire safety engineers and fire engineers have considered sprinklers somewhere with their design methodology. Um, smoke detection is key and suitable sufficient fire uh, fire temperatures are also a key, a key measure. Uh, I haven't put in a hose reel. Um, we haven't put in a hose reel because we're looking to kind of figure those to weigh those out because in, in they're not tested all the time or the training isn't there. If, if you do have them, then make sure that they're tested, people have the right training and the, the right level in terms to um, come by that fire. But if in doubt, close that door behind you, it's meant to act as it is and get out of dodge. And you know, fire safety management, again, is a massive part of what we do. And it's a massive part in terms of ensuring that the holistic approach has been taken into account. So, you know, especially within that design phase and that construction phase, ensure that we have a fire plan, ensure we have a fire strategy as well. Fire strategies are really important for that actual whole building and whole life for the building and ensure that those risks have been assigned and the construction phase for fire safety as well. And then also it's important that those risks are passed on into that occupation phase. So a fire, fire assessment can be completed with a competent, by a competent person to the level of risk that your operations are going to be undertaking. And lastly, the Fire Safety Act. So it came into force this year, and this exceeds the current regulatory form fire safety order. And it brings into scope certain buildings and those high risk buildings. And it looks to assess both the building structure, fabric, external walls, and the common 
part of the actual building. We, along with it, brought the EWS1 forms to look at the external fabric of the building. And then man, they're not mandatory, but they are very good practice and they are in terms of actually undertaken. But also this new act also looks at external walls, doors, and also balconies and very, very importantly, the cladding as well. And, the, and it must be to the required standards of every part of this building. So what this more intrinsically set of regulations or requirements does is it looks to enable those responsible people to have now considered, you know, doors, common parts, common places, and to undertake or refurb or revise their fire risk assessments to take into account these areas of the building. Um, must be the virus, you know, the small person must have that um, duty to undertake this, and your fire risk assessments may be updated and be revised to take into account these new areas um, as well. It's, set, it's the common parts of these multi-residential buildings or high-risk buildings or tall buildings, however you want to call them. And it's the common parts only. It's not someone's flat, but so the common parts end at someone's door. So we can look at that, you know, that, fi that, that fire door, but anything on that is a domestic, so it's, it's for, them, for them to manage, but you must manage the common, the common parts and common areas. And also looking at how we then, especially in the design phase, especially, of ensuring that if we're looking at any cladding that it is of the highest fire standards that we can have and um, to make sure that we don't you know, that we ensure that as part of the new both fire safety act and building safety bill that we provide sufficient fire safety information for once it's been occupied or it has to be retrofitted <clears throat> so that is me any questions and we'll stop sharing. So um, I've got some questions in the chat box, Yui. Um, okay, should we go through them? So would you recommend the new type of extinguisher that allegedly puts all types of fires out or stay with having various extinguishers? I'd go with stay with having various extinguishers. It depends. If it's a new one to me, um, but I'd, I'd definitely stay with the various extinguishers that you've got because we don't know if it's been tested. But again, that's on your own risk appetite as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, another one. What is the ratio of fire marshals per people? Again, great question. I think that's on that's on your own risk assessment. There is no kind of given in terms of what uh, kind of the, 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 the numbers. However, what we must ensure is that there is a suitable number to actually allow escape from that building. You know, you don't want too many because otherwise we're going to run around like headless chickens. But you need to ensure that there's enough suitable fire wardens in place at any one time to ensure that risk is in, is, is, is managed. Um, it's up to the organisations, so in terms of the level of number of people that you've got within your organisation. Okay, thank you. Um, when is the best time to implement compl completion of PEEPs in a hotel in industry? So when is the best time to implement the um, completion of PEEPs in the hotel industry? Is that, um, so it, it's on, it's a, it's a regular ongoing occurrence Peeps, peeps would be, peeps would be, but in terms of if you know that if you've got staff coming in or people that require that, because within the design phase we'd have put in disabled access for part of it, so it's around that regular occurrence. But you need to make sure that's considered from hand from handover all the way through the life cycle of your building. But that will depend on the number of people that require those peeps, and it's also regular revision of the the, the peeps as well. Okay, thank you. Um... Lithium batteries, we did mention a slide on lithium batteries. What impact will this have on road traffic accidents in regards to fire risk assessments? And fire risk, sorry. Traffic accidents in regards to fire risk. Um, it's massive. Um, so Germany are doing a study at the moment and basically on the impact of a lithium battery causing fire, we will basically, well, they have, they're getting a bath and they'll just basically come in, grab it, dunk it in a bath and leave it for hours. Um, so, but that's around um, risk in terms of when it has catch fire because these burn for six to eight hours um, at any one time. 
So it's a, it's a high resource. So it's looking at how we then manage that risk before it gets to that. But that's the process that I know Germany are looking at. Sweden, who lead on, they are the fire gurus of the world. They're also leading on other, other um, uh, research as well. Okay, thank you. Um, just have a check, see if there's any more that's come in. I've got one, um, skips in construction sites. Mm -hmm. So um, I've always sort of gone 2.5, three meters away from the building, um, depending on the build of the building. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, is that about right, recommendations? Yeah, I, I, I see that's I see that's suitable, Sharon. But if yeah, again, if you've got um, something which is timber timber frame, then it must be further because that that jump and that leap in terms of the actual impact on the the it's got a low flammable range where it can catch fire. So if it's a timber building, it must be if not double, if not further. Um, but yeah, for a normal construction site, if we're just putting up say a you know a shell and core of a building, then two to three meters is, is suitable. Okay, and hot going back to hot work. So, um, if we've got um, an area that we're using hot works, but the rest of the building needs the fire alarm system being kept on, so we isolate part of that uh, as part of the hot works. Is that correct? We can isolate yeah. that area. Yeah, you can. So, if you if you're isolating an area to do hot works, as you said, ensure either you can do that on the if the fire alarm system is clever enough, you can do it on the fire alarm system if you're trained and understand how to do it. Or you can also put a like a bag or something to cover up the sensors. However, just remember that to turn it back on because that's something <laughs> many a time is people have gone away from the site and gone, oh, it's gone off because they haven't taken it off or they haven't re-engaged re it and they've they've come away from the site. So if you're going to do that, just remember to turn the system back on. Yeah. Um, there's no other questions come through. I don't know if you want to open up to the group. If anybody verbally wants to ask a question. No. Okay. Are we happy with everything, Ewan? Yeah, that's fine. No, I appreciate it. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for your time. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's some holidays and everything. So I hope if anyone's going on that, have a, have a lovely time. And uh, yeah, we will see you on the 4th of August for another um, great event also we are um, in the process of doing more face-to-face -face as well so look out for that um, soon okay just one last thing before everybody goes you will receive um, a feedback survey um, possibly tomorrow now so if you could uh, kindly complete that would be marvelous thank you very much everybody for this evening